Developed by Sony's 989 Studios and Verant Interactive, EverQuest was created by a team of Sojourn MUD players, who based its core mechanics off of the deco MUDs that characterized MORPGs prior to 1996. While many past games like Ultima Online and Oubliette eschewed the traditional Dungeons & Dragons class and level system, EverQuest rose to fame by embracing it, along with the Holy Trinity game mechanics and raiding of Deku Muds, to create something that was intuitive and easily understood by a mass audience. Countless remnants of the Mud inspiration lingered in the resulting game. Although EverQuest was a fully polygonal online RPG that represented everything graphically, the most important interface element was the chat box and log which replicated the text-only interface of the multi-user dungeon it was inspired by. Some of the status messages, like It Begins to Rain, were replicated directly from these games, despite being totally redundant in a world where you could literally look around you and see that it was raining. Two factors that did change in the transition from Dekomud to EverQuest were the party roles. Being that EverQuest was in a 3D environment, it introduced the idea of a puller, somebody who went out and lured an enemy to chase them back to where the rest of the party was waiting so they could get that monster alone and kill it more efficiently than if they went charging into an entire group. And while this happened more gradually, the idea of a party member dedicated to casting stone skin was more or less folded into the healer and then new crowd control nuker roles, as the concept of a class that could control space by spreading damage around an area was very important in a visually represented environment. The meat of EverQuest's content came in two forms. Grinding up to the level cap, which at launch was 50, and raiding, once you were at the cap in order to try and get rare, one-of-a-kind equipment and other loot from raid bosses. Unlike many past MORPGs that controlled leveling thresholds by defining tables at which characters leveled up, EverQuest implemented a formula that tweaked the necessary experience values at each level according to a player's race, class, and current level. This was basically designed to cause races and classes with fewer surface beneficial characteristics to level up faster. But the formula also included a rather insidious multiplier that among players became known as the Hell Factor. The Hell Factor was more properly called Level Factor. Essentially, from levels 1 to 30, it would be a one times multiplier that changed nothing. But at 30 to 35, it would become 1.1, 1 .1, at 35 to 40, 1.2, at 40 to 45, 1.3, and at 45 to 50, 1.4. And the effect of this was that it increased the necessary experience 10, 20, 30, and then 40%, which created extremely difficult to gain levels at specific points in a character's growth. It required exponentially more experience to get from level 30 to 31 than 29 to 30, and to get from 35 to 36 than from 34 to 35. And if this were not bad enough on its own, players were actually docked experience points for dying, in addition to losing their unassigned gear as they would in a Deku Mud, and could level down if their experience points dipped low enough. So what did EverQuest achieve with all this? No lifing. This was the first MMORPG that wanted players to do nothing but play it, and this was exemplified by its raids. Raids as conceived in EverQuest were either mobs designed on a scale that they required group force to kill, or targets on long respawn timers that were primarily killed for their random loot and which may not reappear after being slain for several hours or even days. And when I say group force, I mean about 30 people. Some of the more infamously difficult raids like the Plains of Hate and Fear were actually copied in structure from existing Deku Mud raids like the Fire, Air, and Astral Plains in Sojourn Mud. To get a sense of what these raids were like, look at one of the original three raid bosses from the base game. Lady Vox was designed for level 45 to 50 players, respawned once a week, give or take 8 hours, could inflict fear to force players to move randomly using her Dragon Roar Area of Effect spell, damage multiple players at once with her Frost Breath, heal herself back to maximum health if the players didn't interrupt her complete heal spell, and at 10% HP remaining would enrage automatically, counterattacking any melee attacks landed on her. The danger of Lady Vox came not just from the periodic damage spikes from Frost Breath and Enrages, but from the monsters and environment around her. She was flanked by five high-level Frost Giants and placed in a room with pit traps that would drop players into a floor below. Attempting to climb back up would draw the attention of other monsters and thus bring them into the fight, so players that fell down were better off dying and waiting to be resurrected by the raid party's clerics. And in 1999, even with the 30 best players in the world, you were still looking at bringing Vox down in about an hour. The bulk of the raid was spent prepping. Players had to physically travel long distances to get into position and remove any enemies that would get in the raid party's way in advance, 
some of them doing so the night before the raid was actually supposed to happen. Once it began, the process was to lure Lady Vox's guards out of her chamber one at a time, pulling the giants in to gradually kill them off so she could be fought alone. Players would then break up into temporary groups and form buffing stations for the party's magic users to enhance their defenses and elemental resistances with spells, before once again reorganizing the team for an all-out assault on the Ice Dragon herself. Actually fighting her meant having enchanters periodically dispel Vox's buffs placed on herself, using Mana Sieve to steadily drain her MP while shamans debuffed her, necromancers pumping their own mana into clerics and enchanters, and tanks doing their thing, drawing her attention onto them so they would soak up the bulk of the damage, breaking away when they could to return to the clerics to be healed. The party had to be careful not to push Vox onto a wall, or they would trigger her complete heal and effectively start the fight over. But at 50 and 20% HP, nukers were called in to deliver the MMO equivalent of an airstrike, rapidly spending all of their MP blasting her with damage spells, while the tanks used stun effects to interrupt any attempts by her to heal. This required an immense amount of coordination to pull off, and randomness could still result in the bulk of players being cast down and dying. Once the raid boss was dead, the loot drama began. Bosses dropped random loot from a pool of potential items, and with 30 people all vying to claim specific things they wanted for their characters, this was inevitably a source of conflict. To counterbalance this, players tended to organize so that the corpse of the boss, which typically stuck around for 30 minutes before decomposing, would be locked down, and only the raid party leader would inspect it to collect and distribute loot. Players tried to agree in advance how loot would be distributed, but they were on some level trusting one another to both play their role in the raid and divide fairly when the spoils were claimed. Winning the day meant not just defeating the boss, but not backstabbing each other or coming out demanding things you didn't originally claim. While Ultima Online was influential, EverQuest was the game that kicked off a great deal of public hysteria about the potential negative impacts of massively multiplayer online role-playing games. The structure of the game itself was not new. It was a Deku mud where everything took longer because of a polygonal graphical representation, but its formulaic structure and derivative nature was what was so appealing about it. The shape of EverQuest was already time-tested when it came out, and optimized to hook players for years at a time, in long play sessions that acted almost as their primary life rather than just their second life. Level grinding in a party, talking and bonding with other players while waiting for MP to recharge and healing spells to go off, organizing and participating in raids were all addictive activities that fed the emotional needs of the social animal we call a human being. Which in 2000, as in 2020, was becoming increasingly abstracted and isolated out of its natural environment. When you consider how people's lives had changed just in the previous century, for a species that was still really accustomed to changes on a scale well beyond the lifetime of any one individual, it shouldn't be surprising that something which reconnected people to an intuitive and inherently rewarding system was successful. No one in the EverQuest target audience saw the fruits of their labor directly, not in the visceral way that an MMO represented, where you worked together in a team with a defined role to kill something, loot its body, and walk away with equipment that would be worn on your character and draw attention from other people. Contrast that to the facelessness of working retail or an office job where you are paid in intangible numbers to provide services to a company that doesn't really know who you are and is primarily concerned with minimizing your own cost to them, from training to providing, or not providing healthcare? For most of EverQuest players, no one at their work would care if they suddenly never showed up again, but their guild members would be concerned if they missed a single day, let alone a raid. So while the public took to calling it Evercrack, it was more like the first example of a widespread social video game, a model the 21st century has become increasingly familiar with. Like Ultima Online, EverQuest continues to run to this very day, but its zenith has long passed by. When Ultima Online was peaking at 250,000 subscribers in 2003, EverQuest had 500,000, eventually reaching a maximum of 550,000 at a time. Its strongest influence was found in the 2002 and 2004 MMOs Final Fantasy XI and World of Warcraft, but that would be getting ahead of ourselves and missing some of the most important developments of the new millennium the first console-based online role-playing games.